Okay, so question one. My chromatic screw, screw gauge reads 0.02 millimeters uh, when the jaws are fully closed. So when you see something like that, that is an example of a zero error. Uh, in other words, it's uh, what the, the jaws have been slightly bent. Um, so it should obviously be reading 0.00. .00. So the um, the procedure with that, whenever you have a zero error, is you always subtract that um, from the result. Um, so it reads 0 0.56 millimeters uh, when measuring the wire. So what we need to say is say that the actual diameter of the wire will be 0 0.56 take away 0 0.02, which is 0 0.54 millimeters. Question two, four balls with different masses are dropped simultaneously from the heights shown. Very important term here, air resistance may be ignored. Which ball hits the ground first? If you got this wrong, a little hint for the future, just try and stop overthinking the questions because um, this is a, a fairly straightforward one. Um, we know that all objects accelerate at 10 meters per second per second or 10 meters per second squared. So they're all going to have exactly the same acceleration, which means straight away we can see it's A that's going to hit the, the ground first, because A is closest to the ground. Um, just a quick little aside, just to prove that, why is it 10 metres per second per second? Well, if we take each of these, um, the only force acting down on them is their weight, which is equal to their mass times gravity. Um, now it does say we can ignore air resistance, so we can assume that the only uh, force acting is their weight. So I can say force acting on an object is equal to mass times gravity. Um, sorry, the, uh, yeah, the force acting on them is that. I can also say that force is equal to mass times acceleration. Well, these two F's are the same. So I can say mg is equal to ma, and the a's cancel. So I can see that the acceleration of any object is always just equal to the strength of gravity. And on Earth, gravity is 10. Um, so all these will have the same acceleration, means A is going to hit the ground first. Question three. Object P moves at a constant speed of five meters per second, repeatedly backwards and forwards in a straight line. Um, so if you think about P, it's doing something like this. Do -do 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 backwards and forwards like that. Q moves at a constant speed of five meters per second vertically downwards. So I could write it like this, five meters per second. Object R moves at a constant speed of five meters per second in a circle. So it's kind of doing that. Which objects are moving with uniform velocity? So uniform velocity means not uniform, means not changing. And the key thing to remember here is that velocity that has a magnitude, which is a size, and it has direction attached as well. So which one has velocity or um, magnitude, so the size of it not changing? Well, all of them have constant magnitude. They're all five meters per second. But with R, the direction's changing, with P, the direction's changing, so the answer's got to be B, because it's only object Q which is going in a uniform direction. Question four. A measuring cylinder contains some water. A metal block is slowly lowered into the water and is then removed. Finally, a piece of plastic is attached to the metal block, and the block is again slowly lowered into the water. The diagram for the measuring cylinder at each stage. So that's quite nice because it's giving us the readings on here. What is the volume of the piece of plastic? Um, so we had the metal block by itself, then we've got the metal and the plastic. So what I want is to know what is the extra volume by adding in the plastic. Um, so it was 70, it's gone up to, to 80. So it'll be 80 take away 70, which is 10 centimeters cubed. Question five. The diagram shows the velocity time graph for an object which is accelerating. What is the acceleration of the object? So what we need to remember is that acceleration 
is the gradient. Um, and so for this, the change in y will be 120 take away 20, which is 100 meters per second. The change in x will be 40 take away 0. So uh, my acceleration will be 100 divided by 40, uh, which is 2.5 meters per second. Per second, sorry, meters per second per second. Question six, a pair of cutters used to cut a rope. Where should the rope be positioned and at which label points should the hands be positioned to produce the greatest cutting force? So this is basically a question about moments. Um, and what we want to do is have uh, the biggest force possible. So in order to get the biggest force, what you need to do is move the object you're interested in close to the pivot and produce your force far from the pivot. And you can kind of think of that intuitively. If you were trying to cut something, where do you put it if you want to get the most force possible? Well, you put it right up against the, the pivot of the blade, um, and then you push from as far back as you can to get the most force. Um, so we're looking for Q and S together. So that's going to be D. Question seven. So this one's all about the idea of center of mass. So if you remember, the center of mass of, an, of this object would probably be about there because the base would have some height. And it's the object where we can say that uh, all the mass seems to act. So the idea is that if I start to tilt this object over like that, then now my center of mass is outside this pivot. So what I have is a moment that's going clockwise, sorry, anti-clockwise, and it will topple over. So there are always two ways to make things more stable. You can always do it with a wider base or a lower center of gravity. So it's going to be D. Why does a lower center of gravity work? Well, if I move the center of gravity to be down here, for example, by putting weights in the base, well, now... If I move where this moment is acting, if it's acting closer to the base, can you see now my pivot point is here? So it's inside the pivot point. So my moment is now clockwise and it's gonna rotate that, uh, that lamp to stand up again. Question eight. An object of mass one kilo is at rest on Earth. An identical object is at rest on a planet with a gravitational field strength of twice that of Earth. Which row com uh, correctly compares the object on the planet to the object on Earth? So we need to know that weight of an object is equal to mass times gravity. Um, so if gravity, this G term here, is double, that means the weight will be double. So we can straight away get rid of C and D. And then we're asked for its acceleration when the same horizontal force is applied. So if you imagine the object kind of sitting here on a table, um, and it's got its weight acting down that way, and now we're saying we're applying a force to it like that. Well, the force is equal to mass times acceleration, and acceleration is equal to force divided by mass. Notice the mass of the object is always one kilo. So it's going to be exactly the same. If I'm applying the same force, um, I'm doing the same force divided by the same mass, so I'm going to get the same acceleration. So the answer's got to be A. And that has some interesting real-world effects. If you're in a rocket ship or in a spaceship, um, you can't actually... Uh, you, you still need a huge amount of force to make something move. So a heavy rocket still needs big, powerful engines to accelerate because it still has the same mass. Um, sometimes you might see in um, certainly SPM textbooks often, they talk about mass being a property that resists motion. I don't particularly like that as a definition. I think it's a bit confusing, um, but it does work when you're thinking about something like this. Um, we can just go back to this equation, forces mass times acceleration. 
rotation. Um, so it's the, the, the force doesn't matter if there's gravity on it. If you want to make something start moving, you're always going to need the same number of newtons for every kilo of mass. Question nine. A square wooden raft floats on a lake. Oh, that sounds like a tongue twister. The density of water in the lake is 1,000 kilograms per meter cube. So I'm just going to write down here for future reference this symbol rho, which remember means density. The sides of the raft are 2 meters long and the thickness of the raft is 2.0 meters. Okay, the mass of the raft is 700 kilos. How many barrels, each with a mass of 100 kilos, could be placed in the raft before its surface sinks to... Ah, oh, this is a great question. So there's a little um, fact that you need to remember, and that is, um, in order to float, an object must displace... So that means push out of the way the same mass of water as its mass. So we're going to need a couple of stages to do this question. Um, the first thing we're going to think about is, okay, so we've got a raft with sides 2 metres and it's square. So okay, so we're going to treat it as a square. So our raft kind of looks something like this. Um, so the first thing I want to say is, well, what is its volume? So the volume of this uh, will be 2 times 2 times 0 0.2. Uh, so what will that be? That will be uh, 0 0.6 meters cubed. So what we can do is we can push outside 0 0.6 meters cubed of water as it sinks into the, the sea. Um, so if you imagine um, if this is the water level at the start, so the water is kind of going to be at the bottom of the raft, um, as we put in mass, oh, that's not right, as we put in mass into our raft, then what will happen is the raft will start to be pushed down and we'll see that water level rise until it's right on the top of the raft. And obviously if we put in too much, the raft will, uh, will start to flood um, and it will sink. Um, Just realised I've got this this wrong, haven't I? Uh, two, that's uh, that's not zero point zero six, is it? That's zero point eight. So again, don't ever don't always trust your mental maths, or be better at mental maths than I am. Okay, so what what we need to say is, well, what is the mass of water that it can displace? So we're going to assume it's going to push out of the way zero point eight meters cubed of water. So the mass of water will be 0 0.8 multiplied by 1000 because it's 1000 kilos for every uh, cubic meter of water. So that gives us 800 kilos. Um, so now we can say, well, I can get rid of 800 kilos. The mass of the raft is 700. So the mass of the barrels that I can take will be 800. Take away the 700 kilos because I need to account for the mass of the raft as well. So that gives me 100 kilos worth of barrels. And it says each barrel is 100 kilos. So I should be able to take just the one barrel. Now that is uh, a surprisingly difficult question, um, especially considering it does rely on uh, content from year nine. You did do this um, with the snow monkeys for most of you, well most of you will have done this with the snow monkeys, um, all the way back in year nine. So a tricky question that one, um, but quite a satisfying one. Okay, question 11. So the diagram shows an incomplete scale drawing to find the resultant of two 10 Newton forces acting at the point in the diagram shown. Um, so they've actually already gone and top and tailed our vectors for us, so they've drawn them in nicely. 
Um, so what you need to do is measure that distance. Um, so on this paper, I can say that, uh, what's that? Uh, 20, 25 small squares is 10 newtons. Um, so I need to calculate the uh, total number of squares. Um, so the easy thing to do is just measure it with a ruler. Um, and then you can say that one newton will be uh, 2.5 small squares. So calculate how many squares they are using your ruler and whatever. So it should be one millimeter to one ruler. So you measure that. Um, and what you should end up with um, is I believe uh, oh, just thought I lost the answer. Uh, it should be 18 newtons. Question 12. A car starting from rest at position X accelerates up a hill. The car reaches a speed of 10 meters per second at position Y. The kinetic energy of the car at position Y is equal to its gain in gravitational potential energy from X to Y. So take the gravitational field strength to, uh, of G to be 10 newtons per kilogram. What is the gain in height uh, of the car between X and Y? So it starts from rest um, and it reaches a speed of 10 meters per second. Um, so the kinetic energy I'm going to call E with a little K is a half mv squared. So it will be a half the car's mass multiplied by 10 squared. Um, so that's going to be a half multiplied by 100 multiplied by m. So that's going to be 50 lots of the car's mass. It then says uh, the kinetic energy of the car at position Y is equal to its gain in gravitational potential energy. Um, so I can say that the GPE of the car is equal to 50 multiplied by the mass of the car. I also know that uh, GPE, oops, GPE is equal to mass times gravity times height. So I can say 50 lots of the mass is equal to m times g uh, times h and i know that g is 10 so i get 50 m is equal to 10 m uh, h now the m's cancel and then i've got 50 on one side and 10 h on the other side so i end up with h is equal to 50 divided by 10 which is 5.0 meters. So that gives us the answer of B. Question 13. A ball of mass M falls vertically and hits a hard surface. Its speed on hitting the surface is V1. It rebounds vertically upwards with speed V2. So it's going to come down something like this. Down with V1, bounces back up with V2. What is the momentum change in the ball? Um, so remember momentum, which we give the symbol little p2, is equal to mass times velocity. Um, so uh, it's going to have v1 and v2. So uh, momentum before will be mv1. Momentum after will be mv2. So the change in momentum will be uh, mv1 take away mv2. Um, now, ah, that's interesting. Okay, good. I was, I was wondering if this is what I was going to say. It says it's speed for both of these. So momentum, this is a vector quantity, so it has magnitude and direction. Speed, that's a scalar quantity, so it has just uh, magnitude. 
So what we can say is the sign of these is going to change. Then that what they've said is V1 and V2, they're always going to be positive because they're just a size. So it's actually going to be V1 minus minus V2. So I'm going to have to add together the two um, velocities to get the total, or the two momentums to get the total change. Um, and if I take the m outside the brackets, I get m lots of v1 plus v2. So the answer is going to be c. A um, little bit sneaky, that one. Question 14. A 150-watt filament lamp has an efficiency of 10%. A 40-watt compact fluorescent lamp has an efficiency of 30%. Each one switched on the same amount of time. Which lamp produces more light? Um, and which lamp converts more energy into other forms of energy? Okay, this is interesting. Um, so idea of which converts more into other forms of energy, um, I'm pretty sure that's going to be the filament lamp because its efficiency is lower. The filament lamp's efficiency is 10%. Uh, the CFL's efficiency is 30%. So clearly it's going to be the filament lamp that converts more. So I can get rid of C and A. Now this one, which one produces more light? That's an interesting question. Um, so I'm going to use the fact that efficiency is the useful energy out divided by total energy in. Um, and these are, that's, that's for without percentages, so I'm just going to rewrite these as decimals. So the efficiency of the 150 watt lamp is 0 0.1, the CFL has an efficiency of 0 0.3. Um, so for the filament, um, I can say that uh, 0 0.1 is equal to the useful out over 150 watts. So the output power will be 0 0.1 times 150. So it's actually going to give me out 15 watts of light energy. For the compact fluorescent lamp, I'm going to do the same thing. So the efficiency is 0 0.3. So that is useful to that is equal to the output energy divided by the input, but the input for this one is only 40 watts. Um, so that gives me an output of 0 0.3 multiplied by 40, uh, which I think is 12. But again, I suck at mental math, so I'm going to check it on a calculator because I don't back myself. But hey, I should have done because that was right. 12 watts. So the filament lamp actually has more light coming out, um, even though it converts less to other forms. So we should be looking at uh, D for question 14. Okay, question 15. So this shows a mercury barometer, and you're asked for which one shows atmospheric pressure. Um, so if you remember this from uh, what we studied in class, you should remember that what happens is air pressure uh, pushes on the mercury, uh, in here, you have a vacuum, so no air at all. Um, so what happens is, as the air pushes down, that pushes the mercury up into this vacuum area. So if you just think about what happens, as the air pressure increases, we're going to have a bigger push down here, which is going to raise this up higher. Um, so hopefully for most of you, you can see it's going to be either B or C is the correct answer. Uh, um, and then if you think about it, if this was really, really deep and went down lower, would that change the height of this mercury? Well, no, it wouldn't. So the answer's got to be C. We're interested in the height from the, the top of the mercury that's exposed to the air to the top of the mercury inside the tube. Question 16. Equal volumes of solids and liquids experience different changes in volume when they are heated through the same temperature. Um, so this is talking about the amount of expansion of things. This is a bit wordy, so um, one to really pay attention to, especially if English isn't your first language. What's the reason for this? Um, so we've got the average increase in separation of the particles in the liquid 
is greater than the average separation, oh, sorry, average increase in separation of those in the solid. That sounds pretty good. Let's just read the second one. Uh, the average increase in separation of particles in the liquid is less. Well, that can't be right because we definitely know that liquids expand more than solids. Um, the particles. So the particles do not expand. Um, when something is expanding due to heat, it's always the, uh, the gaps between them. Uh, so 15 should be A. Just check the mark scheme before I move on to make sure that's agreed with. Sorry, 16 should be A. There we go. Yes, it is 16. 17. What physical property changes when temperature is measured in a liquid in glass thermometer? So the physical property means what is the thing that's actually changing? So the thing that's changing, if you think about how a glass thermometer works, is the liquid expands. Um, and if it expands, it's changing its volume. Question 18. The diagram shows steam being passed into water to raise the temperature of the water. The specific latent heat of steam is 2,200 joules per gram. The specific heat capacity of water is 4.2 joules per gram per degree centigrade. And the mass of water being heated is 490 grams. So we're asked, what mass of steam must be passed into the water to raise the temperature from 19 degrees to 100 degrees? Okay, now... This is actually a relatively complex question um, because and it's actually quite a badly written question. Um, if you remember how uh, temperature energy curves look like, so this is energy, this is temperature. If you remember for water, so it starts off down here at zero Kelvin it means it's got no energy and it goes up all the way to uh, zero degrees centigrade or 273 Kelvin um, then you've got energy as it's uh, turning from uh, solid to liquid this is as it goes to liquid so this would be at a hundred degrees so 373 think so or six can't remember um, and then it's boiling and it's there as a gas so actually what's happening is our steam will be starting somewhere here above 100 degrees um, and its temperature will be reducing down to uh, here somewhere in the liquid so actually if you're doing this a level style you'd have to work out the area under here now i suspect that the the exam's being a little bit kinder to you um, and they're just going to assume that the only energy we're interested in here um, will be from the latent heat of uh, vaporization, but a bit of a naughty question from CAE, uh, just for a change. Um, so let's try it this way. Um, let's uh, find the change in energy. I'm going to write it as delta E, but you might also see that written as Q. Uh, let's use it as Q. Um, so we know that uh, that is equal to the mass of the water uh, times the specific heat capacity times the change in temperature. So the amount of heat that I need is I'm heating up the water. Uh, this mass is in grams and my uh, heat capacity is in grams, so I can use 490. Uh, multiply by my specific heat capacity, which is 4.2. Multiply by my temperature change, which is 100. Take away 19. Uh, so when I plug all of that into a calculator, I get... 490 multiplied by 4.2 multiplied by 100 minus 19. Be careful to put brackets around that as you punch it into your calculator. Uh, and that comes out as... 166,698 joules. I'm not going to round just yet. Um, so now I'm asked what is the mass of steam. Um, so I'm going to let's assume that all of the energy comes just from it changing uh, from steam. So I can say that amount of energy is equal to uh, mass times latent heat of fusion. 
so I can say that is equal to uh, the mass I'm interested in multiplied by 2200. Again, this is in grams. Uh, so the mass should be 166698 divided by 2200. And if I plug that into my calculator, I get... Uh, 2200, no, that's not right, 2200, uh, that comes out as 75.77, which is about 76 grams. So I think the answer is B, and indeed that's what the question says. Now actually that's not strictly true. Um, I'll actually need slightly less mass than that uh, because although the vast majority of the energy does come from it uh, changing from steam into a liquid, there is some energy as well from the steam cooling down from a hot temperature um, and then from the steam will initially be very hot water and that heat energy will also transfer into the water. So it'll be slightly less than that in the real world um, but for IGCSE I suppose that's a reasonable answer. 19. Why is the heating coil of a domestic immersion heater placed at the bottom of the tank? Whenever you... So an immersion heater, just to in case you're not sure about this, um, that's something that heats water. So you might have this um, in your uh, home where you have a, wall, a switch on the wall that you have to switch on before you have a shower. That's a type of an immersion heater, so it's a, a heating element that sits in a water tank um, and heats up the water. So we're dealing with heating in liquids, so you should be thinking about convection straight away. Um, so we're looking here then, uh, looking at the possible answers, it looks like it's an explanation of convection. So we should know that convection is when uh, hot water becomes less dense and rises, or cold water is more dense and sinks. So let's find one that matches that. Uh, hot water is less dense than cold water and therefore rises. That looks like a reasonable description of convection to me and is the correct answer. Question 20. The diagram represents plane wave fronts of a water wave that strike a solid barrier. Now a lot of you sometimes find this a little bit tricky just to remember this term wave fronts. So when we're dealing with wave fronts, we've got to remember that wave fronts are what you would see if you had literal water waves moving and hitting something and then sort of going that way. So what we've got by this arrow, the arrow is showing the direction of travel and the wave fronts um, are the individual waves. So if you remember um, from uh, when we talked about waves, we're going to have a normal here, and then this is just basic reflection. So the angle of incidence should equal the angle of reflection. So it's going to go off at an angle something like that. That's going to be the, uh, the direction of travel, and the wave fronts, uh, because this is a... Uh, well, it's a water wave, so the wave fronts are perpendicular to that. So it's going to look something like that. So our answer must be C. 21. Which row correctly describes light waves? So light is a transverse wave, so I can immediately get rid of B and C. Um, and the direction of the vibrations, if it is transverse, that means it's perpendicular to the direction of travel. So 21 must be D. 22. A driver sits in a car. She has a rear view mirror 0.5 metres in front of her. A bus is 7.5 metres behind the driver. The driver looks at the image in the bus in the mirror. How far away is the image from her? So that's going to be uh, 8.5 metres. Why is that? Well, if you think about what the uh, the direction... So I don't know why that keeps happening. If you think about the direction that light has to travel... <clears throat> excuse me. The light has got to go... 0.5 meters uh, into the mirror, then 0.5 meters back, then 7.5 meters to the bus. So we've got one meter added on to 7.5 meters, so that's going to be C. 23. Sorry, no, it's not. Um, 7.5 plus 1 is 8.5. My apologies. C. Light travelling in air enters a plastic block at an angle of incidence of 62 degrees. 
The plastic has a refractive index of 1.48. Remember, there's never any units for refractive index. What is the angle of refraction? So for this one, we're going to use Snell's law, which you should remember from year 10. So Snell's law says that the refractive index of an object is equal to sine of the angle of instance over sine of the angle of refraction. So that becomes uh, 1.48 is equal to sine of, and this is the correct, that is they have marked that correctly, sine of 62 over sine of r. So sine of r will be sine of 62 divided by 1.48. So r is going to be inverse sine of sine of 62 over 1.48. Um, do be careful with this one. Um, depending on the type of maths that you do, um, you might sometimes work in radians. So you may have set your calculator to radians. I'm just looking at this. My one is actually also set to radians. So I'll just switch it out of that if I can remember how. Um, so uh, you can always check that, but you should see a DEG, a DEG uh, button to show that you are in degrees. Um, really important uh, in order to make sure that you are uh, confident with that. Um, so when you plug that into your calculator, you get out... Uh, 37 degrees. Um, and you can also just sort of sanity check that. Remember, if you do a little car, um, we would expect light to bend. Uh, it's going to slow down. So you'd like, expect light to bend towards the normal. Um, so certainly it should be smaller. They are all smaller. Uh, so no, not much help there, but always worth checking as well. 24. What's something about radio waves is correct. Um, if you haven't listened to the song about uh, electromagnetic spectrum, you definitely should. Um, well, uh, they're not using television remote controllers. Uh, that's infrared. They cannot be detected by the human eye. That is visible. Uh, they travel the longer shoot. Note they're all transverse because they're electromagnetic spectrums. Oh, they have the same speed in, via in a vacuum. Yet yeah, because they're electromagnetic waves, all electromagnetic waves travel at the same speed in a vacuum at uh, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Okay, 25. A police car with its siren sounding is stationary in heavy traffic. A pedestrian notices that although the loudness of the sound does not change, the pitch varies. So this is an example of Doppler shifts. Um, now that's uh, that's not something that you, you need to worry too much about. Um, I do apologise, this keyboard popping up all the time, it's very annoying. Um, so, uh, oh no, sorry, it's nothing to do with Doppler shift, that's uh, me getting confused with the year 12 stuff. Uh, let me get rid of that for you. Um, so, oh okay, so what it literally means it's going nee nor nee nor. Um, so if the loudness uh, doesn't change, Loudness is, uh, that's given by amplitude, so the amplitude uh, isn't changing, so the amplitude must be constant, so I can say it's not C or D. Um, pitch, that is uh, correlated with frequency, that's the frequency that gives us pitch, um, so the frequency must be varying, uh, that means the answer must be B. 26. A negatively charged cloud passes over a steel frame building. A charge is induced in the building by the cloud because the charges flow through the building. So this is an example of induced charges. Um, so you can, uh, you might want to go back and just sort of review that if you're uh, at all unsure. Let me just, yeah, okay. Um, so what is the charge induced on the building and in what direction do the charge carriers move? So if you think about it, we've got electrons here. So it's always electrons that move. Positive uh, things cannot move. So uh, what's going to happen? Well, the electrons are going to be pushed down away from the cloud. They're going to be repelled by it. Um, and they're going to leave behind protons in the atoms. So the charge in the building is going to be positive, so I can get rid of C and D. And the direction of flow of charge, well, it's the electrons that move, and they must go from the building into Earth. So 26 should be A. 
27. The diagram shows a circuit with a gap between points P and Q. The four pieces of metal of the same material are connected in turn between points P and Q. The table gives the lengths and diameters. Uh, which wire is the current largest? So, um, what you should remember here is how the length and properties of a wire depend on its resistance. So, uh, the longer the wire, uh, that gives a higher resistance. The thicker the wire, that gives a lower resistance. Obviously, if I've got a high resistance, that will give me a low current. Remember, the symbol for current is I. If I've got a low resistance, that will give me a high current. So I'm looking for the current to be the largest. So that means that if I want a big current, I am looking for a short, fat wire. Um, so these are all different combinations. So let's get rid straight away of the long wires. And then I want the, sh the thickest wire. That's that one. So it should be C. 28. A battery is connected to a circuit is switched on for one minute. During that time, there is a current of 4.0, sorry, 0 0.40 amps in the circuit, and the battery supplies a total of 48 joules of energy, uh, which row gives the charge that passes and the electromotive force. So we're going to use two different equations to find the charge. We're going to use Q is I T, charge is current times time. So that will be the current of 0 0.40 and the time be careful here this is one minute so that is 60 seconds um, so it's 0 0.40 times 60 uh, which comes out as 24 that's going to be 24 coulombs of charge so let's get rid of a and b and then uh, we're looking for EMF, so to find EMF we can say voltage is work done per unit charge. Um, so the total charge was 24, uh, the work done was 48, so it's 48 over 24, which is 2.0, so we can get rid of that one and that one. The answer must be C. 29. A student uses four ammeters, P, Q, R, and S, to measure the current in different parts of the circuit shown. Which two ammeters read the largest current? Okay, so for this one, it's uh, if you're if you've been taught Kirchhoff's law or Kirchhoff's laws, this is Kirchhoff's current law. And what you should remember is that I will have current coming down here, so I'm going to call that. I1 for current 1 and it's going to split because remember current is the flow of electrons so I'm going to get I2 and I3 and what I can say is that the current going in at I1 must be equal to the current coming out at I2 and I3. I can also say there's no split between P and Q so I can say P is equal to Q and both of them are going to be bigger than R or S um, because the current splits up there. So I'm um, the amateurs read the largest current, that's going to be P and Q. Okay, we're looking at uh, truth tables and logic gates now. So I've um, got a combination of logic gates that gives a truth table below. There's lots of different ways that you could go about this. Um, let's just do this one for fun. Um, and look at the outputs here. So this is uh, this first one. This is an OR gate um, followed by a NOT gate. Um, so when these are both zero, so if I have zero and zero, that will give me a zero here and a one here. So it could be A. Um, looking at B, a zero and a zero, this is an AND gate followed by a NOT gate. Um, so B would also work because 0, 0 gives a 0 here. That would give turn into a 1. This is a NAND gate. So uh, it's an AND gate followed by a NOT gate followed by another NOT gate. Now I happen to know it's just going to be an AND gate. Um, 
So 0 and 0, the AND would give me a uh, 0, but then this is a NOT AND, so it would become a 1, and this is a NOT gate which changes it, so it cannot be C. Um, so I can straight away get rid of that. And then D, this is a NOR gate followed by a NOT gate, and again this is just going to act like an OR gate by itself. Um, and then actually just looking at this I can say um, well so I've got a not or followed by a not so what this one looks like is this x y I've got an or gate which would uh, act like a uh, uh, just just an or gate followed by a not gate followed by another NOT gate. So if you think about it, this is this first uh, NOT gate is going to switch any zeros to ones and any ones to zeros, and this one's going to turn it back again. So I can just get rid of those two, so it's just an OR gate. Um, and look down here, um, this is not acting as an OR, so I can say it's NOT D. Um, okay. Uh, and then looking at it a bit more, well, let's think about the not. Let's think about the, this gate, the uh, OR gate, when we have uh, one and one. So when I have one and one here, that will give me a one here, and then uh, the NOT gate will turn that into a zero there. Um, so it could be a. Okay, what about if I have uh, so and then for B I'll have one and one that gives me a one that becomes a zero so it could also be B all right let's try this row um, so if I have a, a zero and a one zero and a one on or gate will give me a one not gate will give me a zero ah so it cannot be a so it's got to be B um, there are quicker ways you can do that if you're really confident but this way is a good way of just proving it thoroughly 31. The current shows a diagram of the fixed resistor connected in series with a thermistor and an ammeter. What row shows how temperature change affects the resistance of the thermistor and the current in the circuit? Okay, so what we need to think about is as the temperature uh, decreases on a thermistor, if you think about the resistance temperature curve, this is normally the way we draw it, it looks like that. Well, not quite a smiley face, but uh, more like that. So we can say that as the temperature increases, resistance decreases. So I'm looking for something like that. Temperature decreases, resistance decreases. Well, that's just wrong, so I can get rid of A. Uh, temperature decreases, uh, resistance increases. Yep, that's true. Temperature increases, resistance decreases. That's also true. Um, so it's not uh, C or D. So I'm just looking for the current. So we're asking for current here. So the, the resistance here is dropping. So if the resistance drops, the current will increase because resistance stops current. Um, so I am looking for... Oh, oh okay, yeah. So temperature increases, resistance decreases. Uh, let's do it this way. Current temperature decreases, resistance increases, therefore current decreases. There we go. Let's see. Uh, D doesn't, C doesn't work because um, if the resistance increases, the current doesn't decrease, the current must increase. Uh, so 31 must be B. 32. Radioactive carbon 14 decays into nitrogen 14 by the emission of a particle. What type of particle is this? Um, so this one is quite easy to just look at what's happening to the number of protons and neutrons. Um, if you look, we can see that we're going from, excuse me, uh, we're going from 6 to 7 protons, so we've got plus 1 proton. Uh, we've got the same number of protons and neutrons, so what must have happened? We must have turned a neutron into a proton, and if you remember when that happens, we get a proton plus an electron, and we know that an electron is a beta particle. So this must be A. 
33. Alpha particle passes through an electric field between two charged plates. They are deflected downwards. What happens to gamma rays? Well, alpha particles are deflected because they are charged particles, so they feel the uh, so the electric field uh, creates a force on them. Gamma particles are not charged, so they are not deflected at all. They travel straight through. 34. How many protons and neutrons are there in a nucleus of uh, 234-thorium-90? Um, so this is a number, this is always the proton number. So I can get rid of C and D. And then the number of this one is the mass number, which is a total of protons plus neutrons. Which means that the uh, number of neutrons, which is the Z number we call it, uh, that will be 234 take away 90, which will be 144, so it must be A. 35. What happened? 35. Which statement about gamma rays is correct? Uh, they are deflected by both electric, no, they're not deflected by either. Um, so it's got to be D for 35. Uh, they are not affected by electric or magnetic fields. Again, just something to make sure you know. Now, some of you, we haven't quite finished uh, all of the uh, EM induction stuff, so you, some of you might be not have quite covered that, but you should be aware of it anyway. Radioactive iodine-131 emits a beta particle and has a half-life of eight days. It decays to produce xenon-131. Which statement is correct? So this is talking about uh, half-life. So um, remember, half-life, that is the time taken for half the sample to decay. So let's have a look. After eight days, no more beta particles. Well, that can't be true because there'll still be uh, half of the radioactive sample, so it will still be emitting just at a lower rate. Uh, after eight days, the number of xenon-131 particles has halved. Well, note that it'll have actually doubled because it's decaying into xenon-131, so I'd expect the amount of xenon-131 to go up. After 16 days, the iodine-131 has decayed completely. No, after 16 days, it will be a quarter amount of uh, what we had. And all look, that's what uh, D says. So 36 is going to be D. 37. Identical cells and identical resistors are used to make the circuits shown. In circuit 1, the ammeter reads 2.0 amps. What's the ammeter reading of circuit 2? OK, so for this one, I've got two resistors in parallel, so what you should remember is that uh, resistors in parallel reduce the resistance. And I've got two resistors here, they're identical, so I'm going to have half the resistance. If I've got half the resistance, I'd expect to have double the current. So that should be uh, C. Uh, it should be C, the mark scheme says D. Um, so. I'm going to check that after I finish recording um, and let you know if there's any mistakes there. 38. The diagram shows light passing through a prism. Uh, what description happens? Sorry, what description? What happens to light as it passes through the prism? Um, so this is light splitting up. So this phenomenon is called dispersion. Um, and it's caused by differing speeds of light. Um, so the speed of light of red is less than the speed of light of violet light, and red is the least diffracted. Well, that can't be true, um, because if you think about it, dif uh, diffraction happens because of light slowing down. So actually, I would expect the red to be travelling faster than that and be the least refracted. So I think that should be B. 39. Uh, the diagram shows a car moving along a road. The force due to the engine is 1,500 newtons and the total drag force is 200 newtons. What is the motion of the car? So here we have a pair of unbalanced forces. Um, it's unbalanced towards the front, so it's going to be increasing in speed because we've got uh, a net forward force. 
And then last but not least, a student runs up a flight of stairs, what information is not needed to calculate the rate at which students doing work against gravity. So um, we know that work is equal to, sorry, work, the rate of work. Um, so that's an example of power. Um, so that is uh, work done divided by time taken and the work done climbing stairs will be mass times gravity times height over, over time taken. So we're looking for something that doesn't include this. So do we need to know the height of the stairs? Uh, yes, we do. So it can't be that one. Um, I don't think we need the length. Let's check the others. We definitely need the time. We definitely need the... Well, yeah, because mg together, that is weight. So we do need to know the weight of the student. So yes, as I thought, uh, 40 is going to be b.